Okay, let's get started. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, today we're going to look at WinRM versus OpenSSH and sort of pros and cons between the two and whether you should switch from one to the other. But before we start, got to say a big thanks to the sponsors. There's three parts to us all being here today. There's you guys for attending, there's the speakers, and there's the sponsors as well. Without one of those parts, this doesn't happen and we don't come back here next year. So please, I know it's the last day, but please visit the sponsors. Just say hello, make them aware that it's worthwhile them sponsoring this event so we can all do this again next year. So who am I? My name is Paul Broadwith. I'm a technical engineering manager at uh, Chocolate Software. I'm based in Glasgow in Scotland, and I've got 33 years now in IT in just a huge number of different sectors. Um, half of that roundabout is uh, as a contractor in various different organizations. I'm also a Microsoft MVP for primarily my work in PowerShell. So not only is this me showing you the saltire, which is the flag of Scotland, this reminds me to let you know that we speak very fast in Scotland. I don't have as much information to go through today as I did if you happen to see my talk on Monday. Um, so I might be a little slower, but if I'm speaking too fast, I know not everybody's first language is English. Just give me the old Team America secret signal and get me to slow down. And I'll repeat stuff for, you know, as I said, slow down. But it's important that you take away information today. Uh, questions, as I said, we've not probably got as much as I did have on Monday, but we still have a fair amount to get through. So if you could hold your questions to the end, that'd be appreciated. That means we can get through all the material. And then if we have some time at the end, I'll take questions. If not, I'll be about for the rest of the day. This is my last talk of the event, so I can now relax and not have to spend the rest of my time in the hotel practicing talks. So the agenda for today, we're going to look at what is OpenSSH and WinRM. You probably know all about WinRM, but we're going to start from a baseline so everybody's on the same page. Um, we're going to do a little bit of history for both of these, these tools as well. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All software's got good points, bad points, and terrible points. We're going to cover some of those. And uh, we're going to do a demo of configuring OpenSSH and WinRM. Now, I hate demos, mainly because they always go wrong. Um, but we're going to give it a go. If it doesn't work, we'll just dig through the code and we'll do it that way. But uh, yeah, they always give me heart palpitations. Um, we're going to look at some configuration support, uh, manager support on, uh, for SSH on Windows as well. So, you know, all the configuration managers uh, support uh, that run on Windows uh, support WinRM because that's how they communicate. But what ones have support for SSH or open SSH? We'll kind of have a look at that and see where the, the land lies there. And we're going to look at what to choose. We will pick something here. As if you, again, if you see my talk on Monday, I didn't pick anything and uh, we came to a conclusion. But today, we're going to actually pick uh, one over the other um, that will probably work for most people. And finally, what does the future of OpenSSH actually hold on Windows? So the first thing is, I'm going to have a drink. Uh, who and what is WinRM? So, as I said, most of you are probably familiar, but let's start from the basics. The WinRM is a standardized ways to communicate with and manage Windows-based systems. That last uh, three words there is really important, Windows-based systems. Um, it was introduced uh, in Windows Vista in Server 2008. So that's the first kind of operating system it was really bundled as part of. I apologize if mentioning Vista gives anybody sort of involuntary body movements, but that's where it kind of came from. Uh, built on top of Windows management instrumentation, so how it, uh, that's how it really uh, manages Windows, uh, so it sits on top of that. It uses SOAP uh, over HTTP and HTTPS, that gives me involuntary body movements. SOAP is a very, very heavyweight protocol and having used it in the past, it, it always hurts me when uh, I talk about it. So very flexible, but very heavyweight and very complicated and complex. But uh, WinRM is tightly coupled with PowerShell. Um, if you've ever used it, you will know this. You've got a huge number of commandlets that you can work with that'll actually work with WinRM under the hood. They do all the black magic, all the bits and pieces underneath that we don't need to worry about. Um, but it's tightly coupled with PowerShell uh, for, for that. And a little bit of a brief history. Um, in 2005, Microsoft announced WinRM. So that was 19 years ago that WinRM was kind of announced. Uh, PowerShell 1 was released with WinRM support in 2006. And then, as I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, WinRM was built into Vista and Server 2008. 
Um, and that's the first time we really got it um, as part of, uh, you know, the operating system built in as really as part of Windows. And then in 2009, Windows 7 was released. Now, that's not so much significant for WinRM, but I think it's significant for the adoption of Windows in general, particularly in organizations and for, uh, therefore, WinRM. Um, 2000, uh, sorry, Windows 7, I think we could probably, most people would agree, was one of the major uh, Windows releases uh, that, that had support for, uh, you know, organizations, organizational bits, tools, management, um, all of those kind of things. And therefore, when organizations start using it, they're going to start communicating with the machines from one machine. And then that's where the adoption from WinRM is going to pick up. And that increased adoption came out of that as well. And then in 2012, we got some uh, improvements, scalability, security and performance enhancements added in there as well. Again, that will increase adoption. There's still a sort of uh, a feeling in organizations that PowerShell and therefore WinRM as an extension of that is insecure and shouldn't be used to manage machines. Um, I think that's wrong, but that seems to be a prevalent attitude in organizations. So hopefully in 2012, when some of those security um, enhancements were added, that might have assuaded some organizations, but I think it's still an attitude that seems to hang around even today. So, the good and the bad, as I mentioned earlier, all software has good and bad points. Uh, native support for Windows Vista and Server 2008 onwards, so it's built into the machine. You don't really need to do anything. There's nothing to install, there's nothing, there's a little bit of configuration, but that's just to switch it on. Um, and you can configure it beyond that, but it's really, it's built into the box. You install Windows, you get WinRM on there uh, from 2008 and Vista onwards. It supports Kerberos and NTLM, so you can use uh, Active Directory authentication. Um, you can use other um, directory services as well that have uh, that built in too. Um, so it allows you to be able to manage who can get onto what box as opposed to just a normal username and password type system uh, that's built in locally. It's tightly coupled with PowerShell, as we mentioned. You've got those uh, really rich PowerShell commandlets there that uh, allow you to uh, sort of extract away all the complications and all the black magic that's done under the hood for WinRM, so you don't have to worry about it. It isn't cross-platform. As we mentioned a couple of slides ago, it's uh, Windows-based only, so you're not going to be able to start managing your next boxes with uh, WinRM. That's just not the purpose of it. So if you are a mixed shop, which probably most shops are these days, then you're going to have to use two tools. Maybe that's not a, hard, a hardship for anybody. Maybe it's not a problem, but it's, it's a point worth uh, mentioning that it's not cross-platform. It can be complex to set up. Now, if you're just doing the usual username and password, it's fairly simple, but it can get complicated when you start using certificate-based authentication and, and things like that. And um, that can quickly get very complicated and get out of control. So it can be a complex thing to configure, um, but it can also be simple, like many, many tools. It's powerful, so it has its uh, simple uh, aspects, and also it can be quite complicated if that's the way you want to go. But it is a heavyweight protocol compared to SSH. We talked a little bit about um, SOAP uh, earlier on, and I would suggest that's why it's heavyweight, um, whereas SSH is very lightweight in comparison. Uh, SSH, again, will be very much more performant than, than WinRM. That's not to say that WinRM isn't performant, but I think we could argue that SSH is more performant than WinRM, and some of that's down to the heavyweight protocol. So open SSH, it's the old kid in the new town. What, what is it? So SS, we need to start with SSH first of all, and then we'll talk about open SSH. So SSH enables user authentication methods based on public key cryptographic algorithms. A bit of a mouthful. Um, but really where it came from was version one was created in 1995. So that's 29 years ago that that was created, and that was created by, and I apologize in advance because I'll be butchering this name, but it's Tattoo Alongan who created that. And that was created as a kind of commercial product, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But SSH v2 specification was published in 2006 uh, in order to, and that's where kind of open SSH came from, and we'll talk about that in a second. But that was a complete rewrite. It wasn't like a fork on an extension or we'll build stuff on the top of v1. It was a complete rewrite of the protocol and it uses different uh, authentication and encryption algorithms as well. And we'll talk, the reason for that um, complete rewrite was because version one was a commercial product. There was legal issues and kind of taking it and extending it and doing things with it. 
Um, so as it's mentioned there, it's due to licensing issues with the Tattoo's uh, SSH client. So they basically started again from scratch and it was SSH v2. Um, and OpenSSH is an open source implementation of SSH v2. And we're talking about forks here. So uh, OpenSSH is a fork of OpenBSD's OpenSSH and Microsoft forked that. And then we have Mike, uh, sort of Microsoft or Windows OpenSSH. So you had BS, OpenBSD's OpenSSH forked to OpenSSH and forked again to get uh, Microsoft slash Windows OpenSSH. I had a brief history of that. There's only three things to talk about. It was the first pre-release was made in 2015. Um, the first production release was 7720, and that was in July 2018. Um, the latest release um, was in December, just passed, and that's up to 950 beta 1. All of the versions, I think it's after 8.1 or 8.6, one, you know, one of those two numbers are all pre-release versions. I'm not entirely sure why that is. I think it might be something to do with the, the development history, or do you know the answer? I, I own it. Oh, okay. So, uh, there's support reasons. Okay. Oh, okay. So the same, the same thing, but from a support point of view, we have to have beta on it. Okay, so just to, for everybody who didn't hear that, so from a support point of view, they've got to have beta on it, but it's effectively the same code that's getting released um, in both places. So that, that's one of the things I was going to say. It's Everybody seems to be using the beta one, um, and that explains exactly why. So uh, great. And thanks for coming along, pointing out that you own that, and now I'm very nervous. So that's great. <laughs> Cheers, man. Brilliant. Just... FYI, I just might not have said anything. But anyway, um, <laughs> you told me that afterwards. Uh, so um, the good and the bad about OpenSSH, it's cross-platform. There's one tool, so if you want to use that to manage your Next boxes and you want to use it to manage your Windows boxes, awesome. Um, you know, as I said, there's one tool there. Uh, whether that's a hardship that using two tools for WinRM, that's up to you, but it is cross-platform. Um, it's widely supported standards. As I said, it's been around from, uh, since um, uh, 1995, uh, 29 years it's been around, uh, even though V1 was uh, way back then, it was a commercial product. Um, it's, you know, it's been around as a, a kind of tool and a protocol for a very, very long time. Um, so it's widely supported, and you'll find that a widely supported kind of outside of Windows, um, you'll find there's lots and lots of, of uh, implementations that can work widely with it. Um, it's got a huge user base and showing continued development. That's always a problem when we're talking about specifically here, sort of Windows. Um, you've got large corporations, Google being one in particular that seems to kill everything off every 10 minutes. Um, so something like this, uh, even if it's killed off for the Windows perspective, SSH will continue. It's kind of too big to fail. You can't, you know, it's, it's in too many places. So that gives you a bit of confidence that that will continue. Uh, and it's got lots of features, SCP, uh, secure uh, file copy, uh, SFTP, and tunneling as well. A little story about tunneling. Uh, when I was a contractor, this was probably about 20 years ago, um, we used to uh, have to connect our home machines because you couldn't have your own machines in the organizations. You know, it was all locked down. We had to connect there. We had to get tools. We had to get documentation and things. So we used to tunnel VNC through SSH out of the network because SSH could get out, but VNC couldn't. And um, so we used to tunnel that out through SSH and get that onto our home machines and be able to get that information that we needed. So contractors will do anything that they have to do to in order to get stuff. So whether it's allowed or not. It's 20 years ago, nobody's going to come after me now, I hope. Um, it's too late now. Uh, it's not out of the box. Um, it kind of is out of the box, but the version you get in uh, out of the box is very old. Um, you, first thing you should do is really update it, as we're talking about, you know, get that new version on there um, and, you know, get the functionality in there. I think it's 8.1 8 beta 1, a pre-release 1 anyway, that's on Windows out of the box. Um, so it is out of the box, but it's, you should update it. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, it was born in Unix land, so maybe unfamiliar for Windows admins. I'm not sure that's so uh, prevalent now. Hopefully most people are kind of um, cross-platform. Um, but, you know, it used to be certainly when I started, it was very much Windows silos and Linux silos, and I know they still continue, but I think that's, you know, where we're talking about DevOps now, and we're talking about uh, tools and tooling and pipelines rather than operating systems. These things are hopefully going away a little bit more, um, but it might still be un unfamiliar to some Windows admins. 
It's got a lack of support in Windows, particularly for the PowerShell commandlets that we're going to talk about in uh, a second. Um, it's it's there, it, it works. If you're doing straightforward, simple stuff, it, 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 you know, it's a good tool, it works. But um, there is a lack of support in Windows. Um, and the PowerShell subsystem is required if you want to use um, the PowerShell commandlets. And we'll talk about configuring that in, uh, in the demo as well. So you can't use like a session commandlets without configuring this subsystem. Um, and there we go. So we're going to start the panicky bit, the bit I don't like, um, because that's a bit that always goes wrong and breaks. Um, but we're going to have a look and try it anyway. You can see that if you squint your eyes. Yeah, let's let's try and go with it. I'll explain what we're doing anyway. There we go. Let's clear the screen here. So that was me just connecting to the, the Wi-Fi. Um, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to set the, the IP. So what we've got there is we've actually got two virtual machines. We're going to do this on Windows rather than on... Uh, connecting from Windows to Linux. So I've just said that's the host, the server over here. And um, we've just set that IP. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna show you it fails. You probably all know this, we use WinRM, but again, let's start from you know the beginning. If you try and connect through WinRM, which is what we're trying to do here from the client to the server, you get red text that sort of vibrates a little bit. That's an awesome, I wish I could. <laughs> so. Hopefully everybody's eyes is okay and it's, it's not going a bit mad there. But that, that doesn't work, and that's expected. Um, what we need to do is we need to enable P PS Remote, and I don't like the way it keeps flashing as well. This is just going to not work, is it? So that's us connect, uh, configuring uh, the, the remote session, uh, the remote configuration on the server machine, and we're doing it that particular way with that PowerShell commandlet. And then we're going to do it all the way over here on this, uh, I can't type, it's different command, same thing, just wanted to use show both commands. Again, that's fantastic, you can see that that just falls off the bottom, nothing works, and it's tremendous. But uh, there we go, you can see, don't worry about that error, that's intentional, that's meant to be there. Uh, I, should, I should get a medal for continuing this. Um, so that's done. It's not going to show up either. This is terrible. It's going to look great on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, when you can, you're uh, configuring WinRM, one of the things you have to do from the client to the destination machine is you have to set that trusted host all the way over there. Um, you have to set the destination machine in there, kind of security thing, it prevents you in, uh, mistakenly connecting to machines that perhaps you shouldn't. Um, in here, I've just put the asterisk in, that, in there, that means just connect to anything. This is a demo environment, don't do this at home, kids, that's not good, and don't do it in production, because security will be very upset. And then we can run the same, in fact, let's just do that, I'll run the same command again. And there we go, does that show up? No, it doesn't, well, we'll get this to show up. We'll persevere. There we go. So that shows we're actually connected to the remote machine and we're connected to Windows PowerShell. So when RM's working, we've connected to a PowerShell session on the other remote machine. Great, very simple, very straightforward. That's what we wanna do. That was a mistake, but anyway. So what we wanna do is we're gonna then see, well, what version of SSH is installed on the server machine? Um, oh, yeah, I need to remember. Let's do that, there we go. So that red text there, I believe that's a bug because um, it comes up all the time. Uh, if you get the version of SSH, you get it in red text. I don't know, it works though, the session continues, you get all the other information, but it just, it looks like an error. It's just one of those things. Uh, I'm not gonna change my resolution because I'm running Linux on this machine rather than Windows. Um, and I don't want the whole thing to fall apart, but that might fix it, you are correct. Um, <laughs> X11 is not great with multiple displays and then changing, I just the whole thing will fall apart. But um, hopefully, hopefully that, that's uh, clear. Um, so what it's running there is 8.1 P1, which is 8.1 beta one. I mentioned that earlier on, that comes out of the box. Um, and it's also under Windows System 32 Open SSH that you can hopefully see vibrating in the bottom corner there. Um, that, that says to me that that's the one that's come out of the box. That's what we've installed Windows because you don't install software into Windows System 32 Open SSH, you install any program files. So we're going to 
uh, the, the way that Windows, uh, the way that OpenSSH is installed on the Windows uh, system is through uh, Windows features. Um, and we're going to get the information about that through the get Windows capability command. You, again, you probably can't see that, but you'll see it when I paste that in uh, to the machine here. Yeah, and I'll scroll down so we can get that information. So there we go. Uh, so that's shown us that, that what's installed there, you can see the client and the server are both installed um, on the destination machine. And we're just going to also get the services that are installed. Uh, and the purpose of doing all of this is to really show that uh, what's installed to begin with, then we're going to upgrade it. And that one I'm going to worry about. And then when we upgrade it, we're going to show that different services are running and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's just to show you what's on the box and then what we're actually going to uh, do to upgrade it. And there we go. So we've got two services running. Well, you can't see that. There we go. We've got two services running. See, someone's left because they can't. I, I get it. I get it. It's okay. I'm not picking on you. I shouldn't have said that. That's terrible. <laughs> he feels really bad, but I didn't mean that. I just meant this is, this is a chore for you guys to watch. Um, we've got two services installed there, which is the SSS agent and the daemon, uh, which is the server. And they're both stopped. Okay, but they're installed on the, the destination server there. Um, so we're going to actually uninstall those and then we're going to upgrade it. So we're just going to use, again, these are all remote commands. So I'm connected from the client to the server running these remote commands doing stuff. I'm not on the server doing it manually. So that's the point I'm trying to show you is you can configure SSH or open SSH remotely. <clears throat> Did I copy that? Let me see. There we go. And I'm going to scroll down. So that's it uninstalling both of those Windows features. Just using that remo remove Windows capability command. But at PowerShell Confluence, I thought I'd use PowerShell. That makes sense. Um, and then we're going to do, just, just check again the services. Are those services still installed? Are they going? Let me just get that it's there. And there's nothing, there's nothing came back. I'll just show you that. There's nothing come back. So the services are gone as well. So it's uninstalled the software, it's uninstalled the services as we expect. But I want to just confirm that before we do anything else. And finally, let's just do this one. Oh. This is where we could do with some background music. So SSH is not there either. Okay, so it's gone. So again, just I just want to prove it's all gone, it's all disappeared. Um, so I'm going to use, I'm going to try and use the chocolatey package. Now, there's a reason for that. It's not just I'm from chocolatey. There is a reason for that. The chocolatey package uses a universal installer script for open SSH, which actually goes away and configures all sorts of stuff in the background. But it also means that um, it, you can use these let me just scroll that down because it's important I show you this, but I'll wait till this is finished. It also, um, you can give it package parameters, so you can install the client and the server, just the client, just the server, the key-based authentication feature. You can do all sorts. You can uh, mix and match. It is really flexible. So that, that really works well. And I apologize, again, that you can't really see much of that, but the bit that I wanted to highlight, and I'm hoping I can see it, is the parameters for the package just to talk about. Uh, yeah, they're there. So you can see some of them. So you've got the, that SSH agent feature, the server feature, et cetera. So that's how you can mix and match them all. Okay, you install bits and pieces, so it's really good. The other thing it does is it actually gives you some scripts that you can use. So later on, we're going to change the, the PowerShell host that we use. Um, and the way you can do that is through a registry entry, but you can also use a script on here that will do it for you as well. So it uh, makes it a bit easier uh, in the PowerShell package for that. So that's that installed. That's my last panic over, really. And we're just going to prove that it's installed. Nope, I'll need to copy that again. Yeah, there's a code there. So what we're doing is we're setting the execution policy. It's unrestricted. We're going to run a script later on. So I'm just throwing that in there to do it now. We're actually want to use that refresh env command. You can see that's a chocolatey command and what it does is it will refresh the path and bring it into the current session because we've installed um, the SSH uh, tool 
on there, it's on the path, but the, SS, uh, the PowerShell session doesn't know about it. We do that, it brings it in, it's fine. And then we're on SSHV, get the version and just get the path that's installed on. So you can see now at the bottom left-hand corner, program files open SSH Win64. Um, so that's it installed. Remember before we had it in System32 open SSH. Um, so that shows that it's an installed version. You can also see there the version that's installed, I think hopefully you can see it's 9.5 P1, which is 9.5 Beta 1, which is the latest one uh, that's available just now. So that's what the chocolatey package has installed. Uh, we're just going to check the services, uh, just to show you the services that are installed as well. And there we've got, uh, let me just scroll that up. There you've got the SSH, SSH agent and the daemon service as well for the server, and they're both running. Okay, I know you can just see ning, but that's running at, the, at there as well. So what I'm going to do now is just SSH onto the server. So fingerprint, if you ever used SSH, um, if you have never connected to a machine before, it tells you the fingerprint is going to, is this what you want me to connect to? Um, and uh, if you've ever connected to a machine and then connect to it later on, it just compares the two. It's just a scary thing. If you've never seen this before, that's why I mention it. We just want to connect, type in the secret squirrel password, and that's the wrong one. There we go. So it's connected to the remote system. Um, the remote system's got that silly name uh, there, but it's the remote system. But you'll notice as well that it's um, actually not PowerShell we've connected to. It is in fact cmd.exe. So that's what it uses out of the box. You don't tell it anything else, that's what it uses. Okay, that might be fine for you and you don't have to do anything, but we're gonna go and we're gonna configure it. So there's two ways to configure it. As I said, you can change the registry key and we're going to do that. Again, this is all being done remotely. And what we've done there is, you can't, that's pretty bad. But what that is, is that you can see the code actually. Um, you can see that it's added in the PowerShell path, the Windows PowerShell path at the bottom there. You can see it's C Windows System 32. Um, all it's saying there is use that as the shell instead. Instead, here's the path to it. Okay, so if we then SSH back onto it, We get Windows PowerShell, you can see those PowerShell, that's, I promise you that's Windows. Um, and if we do PS version table, you can see, hopefully see the version there as well. So all we've done is we connected previously with cmd.exe, changed the shell, it's now connected to Windows PowerShell, and now we're gonna do PowerShell core. I'm gonna do it a different way, we're gonna do it with one of those scripts that I talked about as part of the chocolatey PowerShell package. Um, and while I know you can't see all the code here, it obviously will be available with the slides and things like that, so you can dig through it. Hopefully this has provided some comedy moments as opposed to deep uh, PowerShell stuff. Maybe we've all had a laugh for a change. Um, so there it's there. Uh, that script runs really quickly. Again, we're running that script remotely. We're running it on the server, and we are just, yeah, there we can, can we see it there? Yes, no, yes, there it's there. No, we can't. Uh, anyway, there's a path in there, we can't see, I'm trying to kind of squint. Anyway, what we've done there in that command is we've actually given it the path to PowerShell core instead. Okay, it's actually a way off the right hand. So can you see path there? And um, that's actually a, a parameter path specs to probe for shell XE string. It's the best parameter uh, name ever, I think. Um, and after that is the path to PowerShell core. Um, and then if we just SSH to it again, We can see PowerShell 7.4.1 because it's come up. Um, if we do PS version table, we can just confirm a bit more information about that. And there you go. Um, so that showed that cmd.exe, Windows PowerShell, PowerShell Core, we can change all the shells that we want to use. Okay. So the next thing I want to show is this. And hopefully this is going to be clear. Uh, let's exit out of that. So I mentioned earlier on about the PowerShell session commandlets and how they were kind of limited and what you can work with. Now, that's a deliberate error, and it's, oh, you can't see the error. Here we go again. Um, 
that's a deliberate error. <clears throat> when you're using the PS session command, let's you normally use dash computer name and put the computer name in. That uses WinRM. If you use dash host name, it uses OpenSSH, okay? But that parameter is not known about in Windows PowerShell. Okay, it's only known about in PowerShell core, which is why it's saying it doesn't, can't match parameter of host name. So if we do that, oh, I need to do that first, hold on. There we go, you can't see that, but I'll do PWSH and then scroll down. So we do that, and I have to give it the server IP again, because we're starting a new sh uh, shell. And if we then do uh, that, we'll get another error. The, that error is what I talked about earlier on. The PowerShell command that's require a subsystem on the destination machine, okay? Um, so that is intentional. So if we go back to here, Uh, and what you need to also do is because we're connecting to the remote machine and we're going to use PowerShell Core, we need to configure remoting for PowerShell Core. When we configured remoting earlier on, we configured it for Windows PowerShell. Okay, this is something I didn't know until I started digging into this, is there's two different remoting, if you like. Um, so we have to go in here into the server. Uh, we need to start PowerShell Core. Uh, by the way, if I know PowerShell Core is not called PowerShell Core. I will call it for PowerShell Core forever, just like that other social media is called Twitter and not the other thing. <laughs> um, it's just how I how I know it. Uh, sorry. Well, that's it, but just not this thing. Um, <laughs> Microsoft can name it what they want. It's PowerShell Core to me. Um, so that's what we're doing there is we're enable PS Remote and from PowerShell Core. Okay, uh, again, we're doing skip network profile check because these are public interfaces, it doesn't work without that. <clears throat> but you know, actually, the important bit to see is that bit there. Um, it says PowerShell Remote has been enabled. I know you can't see all of that, but it says PowerShell Remote has, only been, has been enabled only for PowerShell 6 plus configurations and does not affect Windows PowerShell remoting configurations. Okay, so we've got two we've got Windows PowerShell and we've got PowerShell Core configurations. Okay. So that's it configured on the machine there. And what that also does is it sets up a configuration name, an endpoint, if you like. Um, because if you're connecting, how does it know which one to get to go to? Does it go to Windows PowerShell? Does it go to PowerShell Core? You've got to be able to tell it which one you go to. So the way you do that is, again, can we? Yes, there it's there. So it's that bit, I'll scroll down a little bit just so you can see the, the output. Um, but the important bit there is the configuration name is PowerShell.7, because that's what you've got installed in the end machine. Uh, so um, it sets up two, um, I'm going to call them endpoints. Um, one is PowerShell.7, because that's the major version of PowerShell core we're running. And it also sets up this specific version, which in our case is 741. Doesn't set up 74. Um, so it means that if you want to connect to the latest PowerShell 7 on that box, you just connect to PowerShell.7, assuming you've got multiple versions of PowerShell core on there, um, you can do that. The, um, but if you want to go to a specific version, you'll put the specific version in. So just to prove that, you can't see that, I'll scroll it in a second. So you've got PowerShell.7.4, doesn't work. But if I do the same thing with 7. Oh, sorry, I should have 4.1. I'll scroll, you can see value, so you can see it's actually worked. Okay, so you get both of those. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're almost at time. Um, I'm going to set this up. Oh. You can see again, even though we set that up, it still doesn't work, the PowerShell command list. We need to do one more thing. And this is probably gonna be very difficult to see given the issues we're having with the display, but let's persevere. Um, I don't know if you can see that part, um, but I'll show you it when I put it in. So we go to the destination machine, we have to configure a subsystem. Um, so it's, you can't see that, but I'll show you in a second. If I could type. Um, okay, you can see that very vibratory. 
that's even a word, but you get what I'm meaning. Um, and we're just going to add in there. Can you see it? Subsystem right at the very bottom there. I'm going to paste that in. That's the wrong thing. Just a bit of text here into that file. And it sets up a subsystem for PowerShell core. Hopefully you can see that. There's an option at the end there, dash SSHS. That's just really for it being used under uh, SSH. So if we save that, close that. What we need to do, if you change anything for the SSH server, you need to restart the service. Okay. And I'll show you that actually. So there we go. And there we go, that's that restarted. So back to the client machine. If we do that again, if I can type password. There we go. So it now works. So we can actually enter that session. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, so we've got um, session 10 there. Um, if I go ID 10, can you see my command? Yes. There we go. And just to prove what we're on, we should be on 741. You can see that they are just the bomb. Okay. That's now the end of the demos and probably the end of all of your eyes breaking. Uh, so we're going to we're going to try and switch back and then we'll probably see more problems, but uh, we'll persevere. Oh, 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 well, that's, yeah, I was going to say that's not too bad. If you've, if you've got any vision problems after this, please don't come and see me. We can. It's, we want to know where to find you. That's a good, well, I, I said Glasgow in Scotland, but I, I only, I lied about that. That's not where I'm from. Don't, don't. <laughs> So the Aberdeen will do, yeah, Aberdeen. Gary's from Aberdeen, uh, works at Chocolate, you just go and see him. Uh, we've got seven minutes left, so I'm going to kind of rattle through some of this. I'm, I'm, basically, I was going to tell you what we've just gone through. I'm going to skip that, but if we've got time, I would have told you. I'm going to look a little bit at configuration management support. Um, so we've got some of these on here. Hopefully, they are clear because they're a bit zoomed up uh, large. That's the word you're looking for, not zoomed up. Um, so yeah, so we're going to look at uh, configuration managers. So as, as Kenneth said uh, earlier on, they, they use WinRM under the hood. If you're managing Windows, they use WinRM. It's all built in. They don't need to worry about anything. It all just works great, fantastic. But which ones have OpenSSH support? <clears throat> Only two of them do. Um, there's a Puppet module, um, that uh, SSH module that, that works with Windows. I'm not a Puppet person, so I don't know how well it works. I don't know if it's been abandoned, but it's there and your mileage may vary with it. Ansible, on the other hand, um, again, I've never used SSH with Windows and or Ansible, but I've used Ansible. Um, but they have support for OpenSSH or SSH on Windows. Um, but there is some limitations there um, that you could go and read about. The, you know, there are limitations with SSH on Windows anyway, so that would probably not come as any surprise to anybody. So the choice, um, what do you, what, you know, which one to choose? So WinRM, WinRM is native to Windows, as we said, it's out the box, it's there, it works, it's been there for a very long time. Um, it's kind of, as we say, you know, it's a long time to bake in the oven, it's pretty solid. Um, you know, it, it, what more can you say about it? You know, it, it's, it's heavyweight. You know, we talked about that SOAP protocol, um, and that's when I start twitching. But it, it's it's much he more heavyweight than SSH. Um, but again, if it's not causing you any issues and it works fine, et cetera, et cetera, maybe that's not a concern for you. It is very much tightly coupled with Windows. We looked at some of the uh, badly resolutioned commandlets in the demo um, to do with, you know, the PowerShell coupling for, we looked at the SSH, but we also looked a little bit at the uh, WinRM stuff. Um, but there's a lot of commandlets there that you can work with. And uh, under the hood, they extract all of the black magic and all of the bits that we don't really care about um, away. And it just kind of works. So that, that's good. Um, OpenSSH uh, requires additional configuration, as you've seen. It's not a huge amount, but it does require additional configuration. So that might be a concern for you. It's lightweight. Um, I would suggest more performant than WinRM. But again, if it's not causing you any great concern, then it's, uh, it's not really a, 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 an issue for you. It's got limited PowerShell coupling. We looked at the PowerShell commandlets, the session commandlets, which requires that subsystem to be loaded in order to work. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not great from that perspective and no GA as well. So you're not going to get that through that. Although that is talked about as coming. But the last time I did this talk, which was a, just under a year ago, um, that was also talked about it's coming. So it's nothing's changed from that perspective. So um, whether it's coming or not, I don't know, but it's still in the pipeline as far as I understand. 
So I did blow the budget on, obviously I didn't blow the budget on uh, getting a decent laptop. I blew the budget on um, <laughs> having this. Um, so, I mean, the choice, the choice for me really comes down to, it's, it's when I am. Um, I really wanted to come to the end of this talk uh, or the, you know, when I was looking into it and say, do you know what, OpenSSH is a really viable alternative to WinRM, but it's just not at the moment. Um, it's, if you're really wanting just to use one tool, it will work for you. You know, if your 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 requirements are sort of lightweight um, and and maybe a little bit limited and you don't want to do anything fancy, then WinRM, uh, sorry, OpenSSH would probably work for you. But if you want to do anything a bit more complex, um, you want to do uh, maybe more complex authentication and things like that, um, then WinRM is really the, the place you should be. It's built into the box on Windows. You don't need to configure it other than enabling it to actually work. And we talked about earlier on as well that you can do certificate-based authentication and things like that. So if you want to get complicated, you can do. But if you don't, if you just want um, you know, the username, password, the normal authentication, Win, WinRM works just, just fine and dandy out of the box. And you've got all those PowerShell commandlets there to work with as well. So you can really start getting, you know, it's, it's feature rich, if you like. It's a rich experience because you've got all of that power of PowerShell behind it. See, then I blew the budget, you press it, I've got to press it twice, so the budget that obviously ran out, yeah, and that didn't work. Um, so the future, so this is a kind of screenshot of the, I was going to say you can see it on the URL at the bottom there, but yeah, you can't, you can't. If you squint slightly and maybe, uh, close, only close your eyes at the right frequency, you might be able to see that. But effectively, that's the, the Learn uh, document. It's also chopped off at the left-hand side. But um, that, that just talks about a little bit of the future. And that's the bit I was saying that, you know, I kind of looked at that a year ago and I looked at it for this as well, just to see if it had changed and nothing has changed there. So the important bit for me um, is that WinRM provides a robust hosting model for PowerShell remote sessions and SSH remoting lets you do basic PowerShell session remote between Windows and Linux computers or Windows and Windows computers as we've done here. But there's a bit at the bottom there that, um, it, again, you might not be able to see, but it says eventually we'll implement a general hosting model similar to WinRM to support endpoint configuration in JIA. So it's, it, it, it's coming or it should be coming. They've talked about it coming. Um, so that, that's probably in its future. So there's all my details, if you can read them. Uh, <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, because we're, we're bang at time. If you've got any questions, please come see me at the chocolatey booth. Uh, squint your eyes, you can get me in any of these things. Um, I'll be about as well, this is my last talk, so I would want to spend the rest of the time in a hotel. And uh, yeah, please give feedback, don't use that QR code, because that's, <laughs> I don't know where that's gonna go. That's going to go to some Google page or something. I don't know where well, that's going to go. But yeah, please give feedback however you can give feedback. It's very much appreciated as speakers. You know, um, obviously we've had problems here to do with the screen resolution. People are trying to use that QR code. Please tell me if that works. No. no. Okay. Okay. I, was, I didn't think that was going to work, but good, good for trying, guys. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, it's important that we get feedback. Um, the, the resolution issues aside, I'll... It's funny, I was doing it in the, the hotel and it was connected up to the hotel TV and it worked perfectly. Get in here, doesn't work. Um, but yeah, get feedback, feedback's great. Let's me know uh, that this is a good talk, it was useful, you got information out of it. Uh, you at least got a laugh, which is something else anyway, but it's the last day, so you know, these things are. But thank you very much.